What is up, party people? In this video, we are going to be talking about SIADH versus diabetes insipidus. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. Before I get into this video, please consider clicking the join button. You can find the join button on my channel in a bunch of different places. It's underneath every single video, it's on my channel homepage, and it's also the first link in the description of any video on my channel. When you click that join button, you're gonna sign up to be a Dirty Medicine member, which means you'll support the channel financially. It's $4.99 a month, and in exchange for your support, you'll be able to vote on the topic of my next video on the locked community tab of my channel. And the best perk is that you get the awesome, very attractive Dirty Medicine logo after your username anytime you comment publicly on the channel. Whether you donate or not, I really appreciate your consideration. Now in this video, we're going to be differentiating a very high yield topic, a very confusing topic, SIADH versus diabetes insipidus. Let's get started by talking about SIADH. And I believe that the best place to begin is going over the normal physiology of how ADH works. So ADH is produced in the brain. It's produced in the hypothalamus and then stored and released from the posterior pituitary. And under normal circumstances, ADH will go to the collecting tubular cells and act on V2 receptors. And under normal circumstances, when ADH acts on V2 receptors, it causes water reabsorption through aquaporin 2 channels. And when this happens, to a normal extent, the body is just concentrating its urine because it's pulling water out of the urine and therefore the urine is more concentrated because less water is present in the urine. So that's how ADH functions normally or physiologically. But now let's talk about the problem that makes normal ADH function turn into SIADH. Now, just to state perhaps the obvious, SIADH stands for the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. So we're talking about a condition or a disease state where there is too much or aberrant ADH secretion. Now on USMLE or Comlex, the classic situation that you'll encounter will be some type of pulmonary pathology. And usually it's going to be small cell carcinoma of the lung. In addition to this, you wanna keep your eye open for any CNS pathology or any patient that has some type of medical comorbidity where they're taking a medication known to cause SIADH. The big ones are your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and carbamazepine, but that's a very small list. There's actually a lot of medications that can cause SIADH. Now, regardless of which type of pathology or what type of cause of SIADH we're talking about, the bottom line is going to be the same. The pathophysiology is going to be the same. What happens here is that when one of these causes overstimulates the release of ADH, either from a medication or from an ectopic location, you're supercharging the physiology we already talked about. So too much ADH is released, acting on the V2 receptors, causing way too much water reabsorption through the aquaporin 2 channels. And then this is a really dangerous cycle because what starts to happen is the body becomes hyponatremic because it's reabsorbing so much water and therefore the serum osmolality falls pretty precipitously. And then the body tries to counteract this and it wants to get rid of its free water. And in order to do so, it will turn off aldosterone because from the body's perspective, it's saying to itself, hey, I need this water to leave out through the urine. So I'm going to turn off aldosterone so the water follows the salt. If the water were to theoretically follow the salt into the urine, it would be urinated out of the body. So you'll see decreased levels of aldosterone in SIADH. Consequently, you'll see increased levels of BNP and ANP. But again, the problem is that there is way too much over secretion of ADH causing water reabsorption through those aquaporin 2 channels. So even though the body's turning off aldosterone, it doesn't make a huge difference and the urine becomes super concentrated with an increased urine osmolality because water is continuously being reabsorbed. And you'll also see an increased urine sodium because of that decreased aldosterone. So if you can follow this flowchart and follow the pathophysiology 
from the inciting agent causing too much ADH, causing too much water reabsorption, causing hyponatremia, dropping serum osmolality, dropping aldosterone, increasing urine osmolality, and increasing urine sodium. Collectively, if you can recognize all of those laboratory abnormalities on an exam, it makes answering a question on USMLE or COMLEX much easier because now you understand pathophysiology. So the question is, how do we treat this? The treatment for SIADH is primarily two things at the same time. One, water restriction, and two, treating the underlying condition. However, if treating the underlying condition and water restriction do not work, you can give the patient either Vaptans or Demeclocycline. Vaptans are V2 or V1 receptor antagonists, and demeclocycline induce diabetes insipidus by disrupting the secondary messaging cascade that occurs after vasopressin binds to the V2 receptor. So that's SIADH. Now let's talk about the opposite of that. Let's talk about diabetes insipidus. Now, just as a disclaimer, this has nothing to do with diabetes. The only reason that this is called or referred to as diabetes insipidus is because the symptoms of diabetes insipidus, polyuria and polydipsia, resemble that of diabetes mellitus. And insipidus, the word insipid, comes from lacking uh, flavor or lacking taste, and there's no glucose in the urine. So I'm not quite sure if at some point back in the day, somebody tasted the urine of a patient with diabetes insipidus and went, hmm, this is insipid, this lacks flavor. But regardless, that's where the nomenclature comes from. So in terms of understanding diabetes insipidus, I think it's really useful to refer back to the diagram of the physiology that we talked about with SIADH. And just as a brief refresher, in case this has already evaporated from your brain in the mere five minutes since we've talked about it, the brain creates ADH in the hypothalamus. It is stored and released from the posterior pituitary. It works its way down to the kidney, where it acts on the V2 receptors, causing reabsorption of water. And under normal circumstances, the reabsorption of water will concentrate urine and change the urine osmolality as well as the serum osmolality. Now, in terms of diabetes insipidus, there are actually two types of diabetes insipidus. There is central and nephrogenic. The problem in central diabetes insipidus is that centrally, think central nervous system, centrally, the brain cannot produce ADH. The problem in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is that not that the brain can't produce it, but that the ADH that the brain does produce can't act properly in the kidney. So central DI, problem in the CNS, nephrogenic DI, problem in the kidney. Now, regardless of whether you have central and you're not making enough ADH, or you have nephrogenic and you're able to make it, but the kidney can't respond to it, in both of those scenarios, the body will not be able to adequately reabsorb water. And because of that, what should be regular urine or concentrated urine becomes dilute urine because instead of that water being reabsorbed, that water stays in the kidney and constantly gets urinated out. Hence the symptoms of diabetes insipidus being polyuria and polydipsia. Now, dilute urine, of course, will lower, lower the urine osmolality. So that's going to be the big giveaway on the lab printout when you get a practice question or an exam question on USMLE or COMLEX. Now, briefly, it is important to understand the causes of nephrogenic and central DI. Nephrogenic tends to be much higher yield. So you want to know that lithium toxicity and demeclocycline, which should make sense based on our previous discussion, both cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So be on the lookout on test day on USMLE or COMLEX to get a patient who maybe they describe bipolar disorder, maybe they describe some vague psychiatric history. And then after that, what at first glance felt like maybe this was going to be a question about psych, they actually start to give you lab printouts with urine osms, serum osms, and sodium levels. And now you're like, wait, what? So 
you want to be able to connect the dots here and anticipate what the test writer might ask you. So if you see that connection, it should raise a little bit of alarm in your brain to think nephrogenic DI. Now, as far as central DI, these associations are a little bit less high yield, but be on the lookout for Langerhans cell histiocytosis or craniopharyngioma. Now, most cases of central diabetes insipidus are idiopathic, so you don't have to memorize these, but I'm just putting them here for completeness sake. So this is how you should conceptualize DI. Again, just to summarize and really hammer this home, central DI, the brain can't make ADH. Nephrogenic DI, the kidney can't respond to ADH. In both scenarios, body cannot reabsorb water. Water stays in the urine. Urine becomes dilute. Urine osmolality drops, and that's DI. So on exams, and this is a little bit more geared towards step two, level two, and step three, level three, but I'm putting it here because they can talk about it on USMLE step one or COMLEX level one. The way to figure out whether you're dealing with central DI or nephrogenic DI is to do the water deprivation test. And this is actually pretty easy to understand. So let's just kind of walk through this. So in the water deprivation test, as the name implies, you deprive the patient of water. So you don't let them drink for some predetermined amount of time. And when that happens, the person from the perspective of their brain is like, huh, I need to conserve water because I'm being deprived of it. And as they do that, what you want to then do is give them ADH. And this is the key step here. So depending on what happens to the urine osmolality after you've water deprived them and then you've given them ADH, this will determine whether it's central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So when you give them the ADH, if their urine osmolality then increases, that means that there was no ADH, but then you gave them the ADH and the urine osmolality went up. And that happened because once you gave them the ADH, the water was reabsorbed, which concentrated the urine and caused the urine osmolality to increase. That's central DI because their, their brain could not make any ADH, but then you gave them what their brain couldn't make and the body carried out its normal function. Because it's central DI, there was no problem with the ADH acting at the kidney. Now, if, however, you had given them the ADH and there was no change in their urine osmolality, that's nephrogenic DI. Because even though you gave them ADH, nothing happened. Which is to say that even though you gave them ADH, it could not act on the proper receptor at the kidney, which is the definition of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So the water deprivation test is very revealing, especially on USMLE or COMLEX. And being able to walk through this and ask yourself, if I give them ADH, and according to how their urine osmolality changes, can I conceptualize what's happening? Am I giving them something that their brain couldn't make, and once I give it to them, the body functions normally? Or am I giving them something that they can't use anyway because their kidney is crappy? And that's nephrogenic DI. So this is the water deprivation test. Now, the last point that you need to take out of this video is the treatment for diabetes insipidus. And I'm going to put it here in green. So the treatment for central diabetes insipidus is DDAVP, and that's an ADH analog. So you're basically giving them what their brain cannot create. And in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the treatment is actually diuretics. So thiazide plus or minus amylaride. And basically what's happening here is very complex and slightly beyond the scope of step one and level one. But basically what's happening here is that by giving them a diuretic, you're causing hypovolemia. So the body thinks that it's hypovolemic and therefore in the proximal tubule before the distal collecting part of the kidney that really is the problem in nephrogenic DI you can reabsorb some water, some fluid out of the proximal tubule in response to the induced hypovolemia from the diuretic. So it's a little complex and you probably don't need to know it, but I'm again, describing it just for completeness sake. 
So big picture, know the difference between SIADH and diabetes insipidus. And then within the conversation of diabetes insipidus itself, know the difference between central and nephrogenic, how you differentiate between central and nephrogenic using the water deprivation test, and understand the treatment, DDAVP for central, thiazides for nephrogenic. And then last thing, big picture, know what to expect with urine osmolality, serum osmolality, and sodium in all of these diseases. That is everything that you need to know.